Hello everybody, this is Fabric Academy 2019, week four, biochromes. We will learn uh, the alchemy of uh, textile dyeing with natural dyes, with uh, bacterial dyes, and also how to make pigments uh, and uh, inks um, with Cecilia Raspandi. And yeah, it's a very wonderful class, so enjoy. Thank you. I will start with the screen sharing. Okay. Can you see it correctly? I hope so. Yes, great. So um, this class is called biochromes, and biochromes are actually all of those colors that are present uh, in nature from natural sources. So in this class, we will be focusing on what is the context, what actually is the history also of colors, uh, what are the supports that we can use for coloring, so from fibers but also uh, different supports, um, different types of pigments, inks, and dyes. We will look at both um, natural dyes, bacterial dyes, and also at how actually inks can be made, also to create screen printing inks uh, and printing inks. So we will look uh, at a whole range of different things, but be aware that out there, there is so much more information. So this is sort of some highlights on uh, some of the parts that I prefer. And when, when we talk about color, it, it is important to state that actually color is all around us. And I know that we all know this, but somehow we forgot to look at the world around us as a source of color. So we have completely forgotten that so many of the things that we see while we're walking around in the street, in the forest, in the park, are actually pigments that we can use, and we forgot how to use most of them. And color is a, is a symbol of life. Everything that has color is alive, and it is a very also, it's full of symbolism, though its meaning is different in every culture and every country. So it's something very important for humankind, and uh, this class will actually range through all different types of application of color. So a little bit of history, because to stress actually how important color is for humans. Uh, on the left side, you have uh, an image that I think everybody has seen, that we've seen in class as students many times, as teachers. And it's actually the first time that we've proof of using pigments and colors of humankind to actually prove their, ex of their existence. And this dates back of 10,000 years before Christ. So it's at least 12, 13, 14,000 years that we used pigments to actually draw, and we know how to use them. And on the right side, you have a beautiful object. This is actually um, a painter's uh, palette from Tutankhamen. And it's quite a special one because Egyptians actually used to use only three or four colors, and this one has six, plus some space for mixing, which really actually indicates the fact that it was a very precious uh, painter's palette. But all of those years, we didn't fully understand color because we only started to understand how color works with Newton. And in 1704, he actually writes the first treatise on optics, and with a prism, is able for the first time to separate all the color spectrum into seven colors and start to really analyze and understand how color functions. So before, we are always mapping out colors and dyes, but we were mapping them out simply by, um, yes, by recipe and naming them, but really with simple dots, without actually analyzing how those colors are created. Well, on the right side, you already see the first um, circular diagram for a color wheel made by Newton in uh, 1666. And this starts a whole new discussion, a dis discussion on understanding color of natural sources, organic and inorganic, um, throughout all different systems. The last one on the right side, you have the uh, one from 1800. These are all between 17 and 1800, and the last one is quite a famous one of Goethe also wrote a whole treatise about this. But they also went quite crazy in really mapping color and trying different ways to, to map color as a challenge to understand how it is constructed and how else we can actually analyze this. And this slide is mostly an invitation to also all of you to start uh, thinking on how to do this already while we're looking through the class. Because if you look at the image on the right side, I think you can really zoom into it and read a little bit about it because it's quite interesting the way it's been done.
But so what is color? So color is uh, the property possessed by objects on reflecting light and how our eyes are actually able to see this. So it's, it's wavelengths and it's frequency. And here at the bottom, you have a little link for, some, for whoever, who of you uh, wants to dive into more in what is color and how color functions and how we perceive color, because color is something that we as human uh, read through our eyes, but with only three types of receptors. And there is a lot of information on this, so I would really suggest you to have a peek. At, there is two or three TEDx talks about this. This is one of them. Oh, you find the others. So, but looking at natural, we're talking about biochrome, so we're really looking at natural color sources. So we have plant sources, we have animal, we have organisms, but we also have mineral. And when we look at these, there is quite a big difference because the first three categories are organic colors and the th third one is inorganic. So when we talk about, sorry, I will try to move my thing here to the top. Okay, sorry. And um, the first three categories are organic. The second one, the last one is inorganic. So the first ones uh, actually have an atom of carbon and the last ones don't. Um, what is also very important when we talk about colors is what types of colors are out there and which ones are we going to work with. We're mostly going to be looking at inks and ink making, dyes and pigments. So inks and dyes are very close to each other. Um, they're liquids, liquids, they're soluble in water, and uh, they really penetrate the materials, while pigments are insoluble and they are usually applied on top of a material. And this is quite an important distinction when talking about color application on different materials. So we will start with inks, all the different types of natural inks. So when we talk about ink making, we actually really need to understand how an ink is composed. It's made out of uh, what we call a vehicle, a binder, and different types of additives. A vehicle is the substance, the liquid with which the liquid is suspended, the pigment is suspended. So it can be water, it can be ethanol, and it can be oils and gels. Very often you will see also in my recipes, I use as a binder arabic gum. It actually, um, it acts a little bit like a thickener, like a glue, but it also makes sure that the color is really stable everywhere and smooth the same way. And while in the additive sections, you see um, some substances that are stabilizing, such as salt or uh, preserving, like, like vinegar, but also some others that are uh, pH modifying, so either acidic or alkali, and also metals for mordanting or changing color. But you can also add a lot of different types of uh, thickening agents, such as uh, guar gum, for example. And this is really to create more uh, printing inks. So the different types of vehicles also really determine how, um, how we can apply them. So when we create water-based inks, we look at um, liquids that are uh, where the dye stuff has been submerged into liquid and very often boiled to extract the pigments. And with this inks, we can draw, we can write very well. Well, with ethanol inks, we create what we call marker inks. And the third category, oils and gels, are to create printing inks. So you could be using guar gum, for example. So the, the process is very easy here. I've just boiled it down into three steps for you because it is something quite intuitive. Uh, recipes will vary completely also between the different materials, but also the same material harvested in different moments. And this, this beauty and this depth in color um, that changes over time, it is something very important to document. So a lot of this process will be about documentation and classification of your own work. So a few information about colors and dye stuff. So here you will see a sort of carousel of different types of uh, inks made uh, from different substances. So you will find references such as um, if they're pH sensitive and that is how the color has been achieved and some information on what are the most common compounds creating those specific dyes. So what are the com chemical compounds inside, inside of the plants that are creating the, the pigment itself. So these are some reds and pinks actually on the left side. Uh, it's made with Campeche and it's a very pH sensitive uh, pigment. 
it was extracted in water. And on the right side, you have a uh, madder, actually, who's usually dying, well, dying textiles produces very bright reds, but on paper supports, it creates very soft, uh, very warm pinks. These are some blues and purples. Um, everything around you is a source of color. So actually, the, the one on the left side is made out of uh, elderberries that I co collected in the forest a year uh, close by to Amsterdam. And elderberries are very much also uh, pH sensitive. So it's very easy with a tiny little bit of soda to reach these blues. Later on, I will talk better, uh, more in depth about color modifiers, uh, pH modifiers, and also mordants, uh, more in the textile section. But the same, um, the same information actually applies to inks. So the two subjects are very close. But also some turquoises and greens. And again, elderberry is such a crazy color because you're able to really bring out everything from a pink to purple to dark blues, all the way to turquoises and greens. And the same happens with uh, hibiscus. It's a very close um, range of colors. Sap green is less sensitive, but it's a very, very bright uh, yellowish green. Yellow, oranges, and tans, and browns are uh, achieved with uh, both uh, flavonoids materials, so we're looking at turmeric or saffron or gold flower, but also with many other pH sensitive woods, such as madder and campeche. Um, or even walnut shells are very good for creating tans and dark browns. And onions, of course. The, and here, when we talk about onions, we're talking about the onion peels. These two uh, on the right side actually is created um, with turmeric and ethanol and a little drop of soda just to not make it reach all the way the red pigments, but more the orangey. And on the left side is a madder um, and gold flower mix um, on, in water. So as I was saying, documentation in color and in all of these assignments of today is fundamental. So I'll just quickly guide you through what is important to document, whatever you're experimenting with, and then we will look also at what important steps need to be taken there. So when we talk about um, making inks, and it doesn't matter for what you're going to use the ink for, if you want to screen print on textiles or you want to paint and document that, or actually just understand the color richness of one specific material, it is very important to start with your dye stuff, what it is, what's its name, and try to find the name in different languages. Try please to also have the Latin name. This is very important because very often in the last year it's happened that we know the name in one language but not in any other language. Mm -hmm. So try to work your way out all the way to the Latin name. And I know it will be complex because you will see many families of the same plant or of the same root, but uh, we'll get out of it. Um, its origin, so where does it come from? Where did you buy it from? Because different batches have completely different color outcomes, but also growing something here or growing it, for example, in Japan completely affects the color because of the minerals in the water and uh, in the earth. And when did you make it because this will be very important to actually understand color fading throughout the next couple of months. Some colors don't fade at all and others will need some more more than thing to actually stay very stable on fabrics or on paper. Um, in the recipes, quantities are important but they will vary very much. Uh, time is important but even more important are actually how you constitute, uh, how you created your ink. So what is your vehicle? What were your binders? What are the stabilizers, modifiers, and thickeners? I'll show some examples of this. The way you catalog is less important for me. Um, you can catalog through materials, so actually choose one specific material and then actually look at all the possible shades that one material can make. And trust me, there are like at least 10 shades, 20 shades for every pigment that you choose, for every dye stuff that you choose. Or you can catalog everything by color, so create really like a sort of a uh, color wheel where you explore uh, how different materials create different types of color and this create a palette altogether. So let's look at some examples. Uh, very much like these actually. These are from Rose Studio here in the Netherlands and they were mapping out um, color from food waste. And they're quite schematic. They're also symbolizing really very much this uh, Pantone 
uh, kind of swatch. And though it's, it's a complete contradiction, especially as you can see on the right side, the greens, natural colors tend to have multiple shades within them, especially when they're drying. And you can see the shades on the right side in the greens. And Pantone is the exact opposite, right? I mean, when we talk about Pantones, we're talking about standard color measures. And natural sources do not have this. They have an incredible richness of color and depth, but they don't, they're not really standardized. And this is really their beauty. And we need to understand how we can utilize this pattern. But it needs to become also part of this mindset and this narrative of things that change, that fade, and not that everything needs to be standardized. This is the work from Jason Logan. Um, he has actually a beautiful book about uh, ink making. And he really just dip dyes some of the materials to understand, uh, to keep track of the different colors that he has created over time. But then he also works for the Toronto Color Company, where uh, he actually creates these beautiful sketches and fills entire walls of all different abstract and mark making subjects. But what is very important here, and that you almost can see, is that he documents quite in detail what are the materials that he is using in each of these drawings. And this is quite important because you need to be able to trace it back. So this is another, this is actually quite a lovely combination of two images. These are two different of his drawings, but uh, if you read them together, it says that without a plan, things will be different. And this is very much to invite you also to experiment. Go absolutely wild in trying on different supports to mix different kind of pigments and colors that you're creating. Mix inks and dyes and pigments, whatever you like. Just experiment and try to understand what are the chemical reactions. And later on, we can help you figuring out what is the specific chemical reaction that actually happened. But you can also document in a little bit more schematic way, trying to with color blotches, as long as you're sure uh, to document when you made it, what's in there, what were your modifiers, and what's your vehicle. So, and also here, that you're able to identify that, for example, in the yellow and orangey areas, there is uh, some vinegar, while in the more purple and blues, we're using some sodas to actually get those blues out of the material. These are both ethanol-based, and you see that very much from the absorption of the color in the paper. So these are basically marker inks. You can use this in a pen, or you can paint with them. But you can also document them like this into strips. So I like to combine the two things constantly. So going from something that is fully expressive where you're trying to understand how also how rich the pigment that you have created is, but then also very schematically to sort of keep track of what is what, how did you make it, and have really a, an archive for yourself. This is the way uh, I usually document uh, these color swatches. Uh, so, but what is important, as I was saying earlier as well, is the name, its Latin name, preferably also the English name, um, what it was the raw material, so also what form was the raw material. There's a huge difference in having campeche made out of wood chips or in powder or in extract. There is completely different results. So the state of your raw material is very important. What was the vehicle, modifier, binder, stabilizers, the recipe? But also on the right side, what you see is a comparison. So this is a comparison made by all different um, uh, pig, um, inks made by, with uh, Campeche. So by changing and modifying the pH of this material, we can range from purples to uh, brown, beige, all the way to reds and bordeaux. And having this color variation, as you see also, uh, not the last one, but the one above, with the oranges and the and the purple, this is one one swatch made with one color. The only thing we did is actually applying some mordants and modifiers to have the whole range of colors in one block. So this is one way of documenting it. But as you've seen also in the other examples before, there are multiple. The important thing is to document, and I will keep repeating this throughout the class so that you can really keep track of what is happening. Because some of the materials you will see, you will be painting with like beets or with uh, elderberry, and you will see how you're painting in pink. But then when it's drying, we're actually reaching purples and blues because of the oxidation that is happening with the material while it's drying. 
Does anybody have any questions? Otherwise, I will continue with the dice. I have a question. Possible to stop oxidation? If you want to stop oxidation, you're not going to stop oxidation. No way. But actually, embrace, I would say embrace the oxidation and use something else that will reach the different color uh, before it oxidizes. You mentioned something about support. What do you mean by support? Uh, I mean different types of uh, material in which you can uh, draw. So basically, when we're making inks, uh, you have many different applications. So you could be uh, drawing on paper, on regular paper. So if you're doing that, please make sure it's acid free. Uh, but you could be drawing on a uh, cotton aquarelle paper that absorbs very much, but also on wood. Uh, all different types of cellulose absorb these inks very well. You can use them for screen printing or, again, you can actually use them for dyeing because the moment you have a color extract, you're really able to use this in, in a dye bath. So the supports are all the different types of materials on which uh, you want to test this. And for the dyes part, we will see there is quite a big difference in uh, animal and vegetable. Um, but the supports for inks are usually, not always, but are usually uh, vegetable based. So it's different types of cellulose and different types of paper. I'll continue. Cecilia. Yeah. Um, one point is because with the water, I has last year a lot of problems when you change or you put the clean the color in the water change completely because depends of the ph of the water of the, in the lab yeah. you change or your results uh, and the point Completely. is it's better use mineral water or distillate distillate water for dyes to know perfectly what's the ph are you using or or so you this is a lovely question yeah so this is lovely question because as you can approach in both i would say use really just use the water that from the tap because actually that specific color change that is created by your tap water is brilliant and it is local it is a, like it is really about that locality and actually understanding the materials around us so the water is a factor in that but what you can do is two things you can measure the ph with a ph strip but you could also simply be using um a piece of cabbage. I think everybody can go out there and get a piece of cabbage to measure the pH. So you can simply add some water and see how it's changing. Cabbage, uh, as long as also hibiscus, but hibiscus is very acidic to start with. So I would say cabbage is the best uh, pH reader. You can um, submerge it in water and actually see what color is being extracted first. Um, it should be around purple, but if it's pink, your water is very acidic. And if it's a very dark purple tending to blue, it's very alkaline. So then you can slowly work your way back using a little bit of vinegar or a little bit of soda to actually reach uh, 7 pH, which is the, the base, a neutral uh, pH. But I will say embrace it because it's so beautiful. There's so many difference between the water that I have here in the lab and the one that I have at home. And I mean, it's a five minute cyclone from here to there completely different results and comparing these constantly makes you learn so much also about your dye stuff and your materials that you're using that is actually take it as a challenge and explore even further i will continue i guess any other questions good hello yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I asked um, in the chat because we're talking about pH neutral. Yeah. Does do we have to take this into consideration with the papers as well when we're dying? So 90% of paper nowadays is acid free. Uh, so yes, but most of it is already acid free because it's not very good to have. Uh, the, they've changed the process of uh, manufacturing paper. So 90% of the paper you will find out there is already acid free, but you can go and ask that whenever you are purchasing paper. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So focusing now actually on the dyes, what are dyes? So there are many different types of dyes and uh, some of these are acid dyes, basic dyes. You have more than dyes where they actually combined uh, already with the dye itself. There are vat dyes, which is what we use for indigo. 
but also disperse. Uh, azoic dyeing is actually something we definitely do not use any longer because it's uh, azo dyes, which are quite toxic. In Europe, they are completely banned. And of course, some fruit dyes. But it is important to understand that there is a very vast range of different types of dyes that we can produce and different application methods for each one of them. We will not go through all of them, but the moment you realize that one material, one dye stuff doesn't work too well with a specific type of process, ask and we can figure out, uh, I can send you some tips of how else uh, to extract the color from that specific dye. A very good example of this is always uh, Alcanet. Alcanet is a dye that in water yields um, like gray purples, uh, quite light in tone, so all these lilas, but actually in ethanols, it gives bright reds and blues. So it is very important to really try different types of methodologies for extracting color when you see that your matter is not giving out any, any dye. This is a little bit of history from natural to synthetic dyes, and this is mostly here for you to have a read afterwards. The only important thing, a really relevant thing in here is actually um, the fact that in 1856, MOV was created, uh, which is the first synthetic dye, and that completely changed the way we work with dyes. Because before that, we only worked with natural dyes. Ten thousands of years of only working with natural dye and one pigment, one synthetic pigment completely changed the history of this. This was a complete accident. And like that, there have been many others. Um, it was an accident in the sense that they were trying to create a cure, um, and instead he created mauve, which was purple. And from there, hundreds of different types of synthetic dyes came out. And the experimentation went wild, with, which gained us a ton of knowledge, but nobody was questioning the consequences. For example, there are a few examples in history uh, that I very much enjoy. Uh, this is one of them. There are three or four very famous different poisonous inks uh, that were very fashionable. Uh, these two greens that you see here are Paris green and Shelley's green, and they're both based on arsenic. So women in Victorian times were wearing uh, these green dresses. Their houses were covered in very fancy green uh, wallpaper. But all they were doing all day was actually getting um, poisoned and soaking up all of this arsenic in their bodies without realizing. So when we work with all of this natural matter, it is so important to also question the consequences of whatever we're coming up with. And this is something that we need to continuously do whatever research we're doing. It doesn't matter how experimental and it doesn't matter what the topic is. Another few examples of uh, very poisonous colors. It's another green um, made uh, by, um, oh God, now I can come up with a name. Um, it's the Marie Curie green with radium, which was almost fluorescent, which is emitting actually a radiation. And we were covering jewelry, clothes, wallpapers again, even things where we were eating from, glasses, everything was decorated with it because nobody was realizing how toxic it was. But also, uh, very simply, white lead. It was every painter's favorite color, but it's incredibly poisonous. And because it's such a thin powder, all the painters were breathing this in. But, and they, even when they knew it was, um, it was so toxic, they kept using it because no other white matched the same whiteness as white lead. And there is a few others. There's also orange uranium used in pottery and in glazings, and there, there are a few others. But it's, this is just to say that not all natural uh, color sources are safe. So whatever you're trying to experiment with, have a good read about it, figure out also what it is, where it comes from. The same way we work with, for example, laser cutting materials. We don't put everything under the laser, we read up on it. It doesn't matter if these materials that we're going to look at throughout this class are natural, you do have to have a look at what you're working with. So, and here comes my favorite question every time. I'm asking you what color you are wearing, because now we're really diving into the toxicity also of dyes and how we have not been questioning this enough. 
When we look at the etiquettes in our clothes, no words mention how they've been dyed. And this is quite weird. Throughout history, we have been asking more and more information about our clothing, about the fabrics that we use. Now we want to know who made it, where, how, is it organic? But nobody's talking about how it's been dyed. And actually, this image that you see here is not some kind of fake happy image. It's really the way those waters look like. And the color that you're wearing is affecting this. And this is simply to state also that we need to question this site and actually start understanding and researching different ways of producing colors for whatever we are doing, because color is all around us. And as designers and creators, we use color to communicate everything. And color is so important, and we should keep it that way, but question it. And this is another very classical image also to really talk about the water pollution uh, behind the dyeing industry. Because also when we talk about the fact that the textile industry is the second most polluting one, we're actually talking mostly about the water pollution. Because everything that we produce from the cotton that needs to be ginned and then spun and then woven, every step of the way has water involved in it, filled with chemicals, and also for the dyeing. And its lifespan of garments and textiles continues with chemicals actually in our washing machines every day. So this is what a conventional dyeing process uh, water consumption looks like, um, where very much of it is actually bleaching. And bleaching is one of the most disastrous parts because all of that bleach has then been thrown, discarded non-well into um, waters, ending up to look a little bit like this. And I know that these places are not close to us, but it is killing everything around us in flora and fauna. And we do need to find real alternatives and quickly. So Greenpeace has actually been doing quite a good job on this. In the detox program, they have been looking at listing all different types of chemical. They started with a list of five or six, and actually this list has been expanding and expanding and expanding. And all of the chemicals that they're looking at, they're actually looking for alternatives to. So these are some of them. Azo dyes were also mentioned earlier. They are now banned in Europe. They're not banned worldwide, which is still a problem. But all of the other materials, as you can see, many of them are heavy metals. I mean, we're talking about cadmium and lead and mercury and chromium. But we also see a lot of chlorine-based materials. And none of these are very good for our environment, nor for us. Because if you think about it, you're wearing clothes all day. None of us is naked. I mean, we're wearing this, it's on our skin, and our skin is breathing in everything that it's in contact with. And for how much you can wash these pigments and these chemicals out, they're not all good. So we're going to have a look. We have now seen a little bit of synthetic dyes today, but we're also really going to look at natural dyes, which is something that you can very, very easily experiment with and achieve beautiful results. Um, but when we talk about natural dyes, the most important part is actually also really looking at animal fibers, looking at how those are made and how differently they absorb the dye and why. So we have animal and vegetable fibers. When we talk about animal fibers, we're 90% of the time talking about wool, silk, angora or mohair, alpaca or camel. So these are all protein-based fabrics where um, especially in like different types of hair and wool, what we see is that uh, they're made a little bit like our hair. So they're made out of scales that open up through heat so that the dye and the mordant actually can uh, fully penetrate the material. So the mordant actually attaches itself to um, the cortex of the fibers and then the dye attaches itself to the mordant. So they're very good at hosting a lot of dye and this is why they tend to be uh, favorites for natural dyeing. And very similarly also for silk fibers. When we look instead at vegetable fibers, such as cotton, linen, ramia, hemp, but also sisal or yuta and viscose, uh, we are looking at materials that are fully based of cellulose. They have a much harder time in absor absorbing and bonding with uh, mordants, 
And uh, this is why often they're also being combined, not always, but often they're combined also with tannins or they're being scored beforehand with uh, sodium carbonate. This opens up the fibers much better so that the mordant can penetrate and then the dye can bond uh, better with the mordant. Um, and here you have two examples of cotton fibers and linen fibers to also really to start understanding how these materials are made on the inside. So process-wise, um, here you really have, uh, you will see this coming across in the presentation, a few different steps that you can really use as a sort of guidelines because all different types of dyes have different types of recipes. Uh, I've listed a few recipes, but the process is very often the same. So these are your tools, your ingredients, uh, some of the very important safety rules. Um, and then for the rest, a general process for you to keep as a guideline. But when documenting, please go in depth into exactly how you made it. Um, so in the first step, we always need to prepare fibers. So we do this in two completely different ways for animal and vegetable fibers. So here you find the two different recipes and also uh, the definition of, the, um, of how to prepare vegetable fibers before being more than that. So when we are scoring them with soda ash, which is uh, sodium carbonate, to open them up and then more than them. With wool and other animal fibers, that is not necessary. What are mordants? So mordants, um, there are many different types of uh, mordants actually. Some of them uh, are present in nature, most of these, um, and some others have been banned. So these three that I'm showing you are actually the ones that are not toxic or at least as least toxic as possible. So alum um, is actually found in rocks, it's a big mineral, and it really brightens up a lot the colors. Uh, iron comes from, we can use the one coming from rust and from rusty nails. I will show you after the recipe for this. And also copper. Copper can be very well made with copper pipes. So here you have how to actually use the alum. Alum usually comes in crystals, either natural or synthetic, but it's also very much used for, for example, henna and fixating colors also in these kind of ways. And it really brightens up and fastens the color into the material much better. Copper um, instead is really good for all these blue hues and greens because also combined with yellow dyes, it really brings up the greeny side of, uh, of those yellows. Um, you have the two different recipes for uh, the different materials, um, but it is important with this material actually to realize that you should be wearing a copper glove, uh, rubber gloves and uh, actually open the windows and have a ventilated area. Um, to create copper liquor is the same process to create iron liquor. So what you do is actually um, either use rusty nails or copper pipes and then mix them with 50% of water and 50% of vinegar. And if you add a little bit of salt, you will, um, you will have this oxidation process going much faster. It works as a catalyzer and you will be able to use the iron and copper liquors already this week if you have not yet started preparing them. A good point actually for the copper pipes is they're usually coated. So if you hammer them a little bit or bang them down, then you'll be able to extract the color much faster. And for iron, actually rust, already rusty nails will work beautifully and very fast. Iron is also a mordant, but it's mostly used also as a pH modifier and color modifier in the sense that the combination of metal and vinegar actually saddens the color very much. So when we want to reach more grayish tones or black tones or darker tones, we use uh, iron mordant or an iron modifier afterwards. Because when uh, mordanting the fibers in iron, we will have a little bit of this yellow, brown, tan uh, hue onto it. So I wouldn't suggest that for uh, light greens or cold colors. But it's very good to be used afterwards uh, as a modifier. So here you see also you have a short list of actually how these modifiers completely change the color ranges, where acidic modifiers mostly move uh, pigments and color and dye stuff that from red to orange, from purple to pink, and from rust to yellow or blue to purple. So 
they're actually brightening up and going to warm the warm colors, while the alkaline one are helping us to go towards the cold colors. So if we have pinks, we move towards purples and blues and greens, and from yellow, we move to dark reds. Uh, copper modifiers, as we were saying, will give us this uh, yellow hue, uh, this bluish hue, and um, the iron ones a yellowish hue. Here there are a list of uh, recipes for all of you. Um, the recipes actually will vary quite a bit, uh, also based on the different types of uh, materials that we will be using. So turmeric coming from um, different parts of the world will actually have quite a different uh, impact and affecting the, the material differently. You can have very soft yellows or very bright yellows. It's not the most uh, fast um, wa washing fast color, but you can add a little bit of pomegranate um, uh, peels or onion peels to actually fixate the color better because that sort of supports uh, the color in the same range, uh, but helps with the fastening. And uh, this is one of the few material for which uh, no modifier is actually needed. Uh, Anato also uh, called achote, so for all of these, turmeric is also curcuma for us. So you will see different names in different languages, but please, again, tag them all. It is so important to have that part too. Uh, but also anatto, anatto creates beautiful peach colors. Uh, it is not pH sensitive uh, and it's usable both dry and uh, wet. So if you are anywhere in South America, I would really suggest go out and uh, see if there is a and I chose the tree and actually use the seeds when they're fresh because they create much brighter colors and they're absolutely beautiful. Also for ink making, um, fresh anato seeds are beautiful for ink making. Uh, hibiscus, hibiscus is something that I think we drink as a tea worldwide. So you can have two in one, you can make some tea and you can make some beautiful dyes. <laughs> Has an incredible smell as well. And um, it is very easy to actually change the color range of this material just by adding a little bit of uh, vinegar or a little bit of soda. Onion skins. This is one that I like very much because it's actually a waste material and it creates some of the most beautiful golden browns that I've ever seen, especially on silk and on um, um, composites of like silk and wool, it, the colors are incredible. They're extremely bright. And if you use a little bit of alum more than those colors will really um, come out. And please, there is one thing that's very important. If you do the onion peels, separate red and golden onion skins because they should not be mixed. They create two different types of uh, color ranges and actually analyzing and comparing those is quite an interesting exercise. But also madder. Madder is uh, a root of a, quite a, a small plant. And when it's about three to four years old, we harvest this root, we chopped it up. And uh, when it's dry there, it's, it creates incredible shades of red, of Bordeaux, of browns, of oranges, and of yellows. So madder is actually called, um, it, it's one of those dyes that you can keep reusing. Even when, the, when you have uh, finished your dye bath, you can reuse it again and again, and it will continuously yield different colors. If you do want to use this one, I suggest that you put it at least, let's say, two hours in advance into water, because it really, if you have dry chips, it really needs to rehydrate itself. And, uh, and it does take a while. So don't put it straight away in hot water and never, ever, ever boil this, uh, this dye bath. So keep it in a simmering temperature. This doesn't work for all of them, but for most of them, simmering is better than boiling. Because the moment you boil matter, you're going to lose all of the red shades and all of the purple shades, and you're going to have only browns. Campeche is another incredible wood. It's a wood that uh, yields incredible bright fuchsias and purples even though you wouldn't expect it from the look. Um, these are dried flakes and uh, they react very well in both water and uh, in ethanol. Alcanet is the same. Alcanet is uh, one of the plants that you also find uh, in the recipes, uh, also for the ink making that I will send. 
and these uh, roots yield beautiful reds and purples and blues, but only when extracted with ethanol. When you extract them in water, you will have very soft grayish purples. And here another few extra ones uh, from uh, the previous years. Uh, so black beans are one of those very funny ones. And it's one of those uh, that you always think when you make them for the first time, oh my God, I did everything wrong. It is a cold dye. It is a dye that doesn't need to have any boiling. And uh, you can actually use the beans afterwards. What we do is that we soak for about 24 hours black beans uh, in water. And then we take out the black beans and we only we let the water sit for another hour or so. And then we submerge the fabrics that have been mordanted. You will see very bright blues and purples. Um, and it is pH sensitive, so also ranging towards pinks. Never ever heat it up. And if you will see that the water that you extract <coughs> from these beans is like brownish and you think like, shit, I really messed up, you didn't. Submerge the fabric, take them out, they will be brownish, and then they will start oxidizing as soon as they're in contact with the uh, air, and then they, uh, they will turn into blue. So it's sort of like also black beans on, uh, on paper. It's like cabbage on paper. It's the same. They will change as they're drying, and it's an incredible experience uh, to try this out. But also cabbage, because cabbage is in everybody's kitchen, and... I don't want to hear like, yeah, but those weird woods, I couldn't find them. There is plenty of things in your kitchen. And cabbage is one of them. It works really nicely also on, uh, especially on, um, on wool and on silk. And you can get these bright pinks, but also some blues, some purples. And it's quite funny to keep changing. Use it both as a pH reader, but also to really keep changing the color. What I actually did uh, three years ago was dyeing um, with a friend the top from white to purple in cabbage. But uh, we were in Portugal and this place where we were at, the earth is very alkaline. And it was a bright pink t-shirt until it started drying and it turned completely blue because of the air was so filled with, um, the earth is so alkaline there, it was just drying there that actually that completely changed the color. We did the same thing here in Amsterdam pink no blue at all <laughs> so consider all of these also as as blessings whatever is your uh, environment around you and another one that is always fun is uh, lichens actually to collect those you should really be careful and cut them off and not rip them off um but for example um when i go in summer in portugal i collect many of them they're even falling from the trees uh, so when you find those even better and they yield beautiful warm oranges and reds and browns. They can be extracted both in ethanol and in water, but you need to add a little bit of soda to actually have this reaction happening. Another one that's not here uh, is, um, is avocado. And actually to extract the color from both avocado peels and avocado nuts, you can add a little bit of ammonia and you will get this uh, very soft, dusty pinks. If you use both of the parts, so the shell and the nut, but if you use only the nut, you will have much more of those pinks, RNG pinks, because it's the same thing as when you slide into it in an avocado pit, you have this red color coming out. Are there any questions about the natural dyes part? Mm -hmm. How to know the concentration when you create iron liquid and... Uh... You can't. When you are creating it yourself, you can't. What you can do is compare it with uh, one that is uh, synthetically made. So you can buy them powders and then actually compare uh, how they're being used and then you know your concentration. But you do need a reference, basically. So I don't know if you could hear the question. The question here was about uh, how to know the concentration of your um, copper and iron liquids. That is always difficult. Because then you don't have a precise measure for the water. Yeah. So you just put a bit. You, you do measure that uh, anyway a little bit. Uh, what I do is actually trying to keep a different color range of also the copper ones. So some of them are really dark and some are much lighter. Uh, and if you can try to stick to a different copper range and then you start and you always have this, then you have like a medium color, a light one and a dark one. And this is sort of your... You're guessing. Yeah. Okay. 
but it's it's difficult to have a precise measurement of that when uh, you're crafting it yourself. Uh, can we use uh, iron uh, food supplement to change the color? Uh, I don't know what is exactly in the iron food supplement. If you send me what's exactly in it, then yes, I can tell you. So what is the composition? Because I don't know what they have in the food supplement. They probably also have a lot of other stuff and that other stuff might be affecting. Very similar is when we talk about uh, soda. Because um, when I'm mentioning soda, I, I'm talking about sodium carbonate or soda ash and not bicarbonate, but carbonate. And what you buy in supermarkets is sodium bicarbonate and that usually is used for cleaning and therefore also has some whitening agents, which are not very good when you're trying to modi simply modify the color of your uh, dyes, because then you will have all of a sudden almost whites rather than uh, bright blues or reds. Are there any other questions? When you use soda? Yes. Yes. What was the question? Um, I wanted to ask because you were giving the example about the black beans and you mentioned it takes 24 hours uh, that it needs to be in water. Is mm -hmm. it really, really has to be 24 hours or like overnight? It can, or? it can be less, but and you can already add your fabrics within uh, them with the with the beans. This is what something you could do. Though the first colors that your fabric will be absorbing are not the the ones, the enzymes that will actually turn blue. Okay. Thank you. Somebody's asking <laughs> of um, allergy. Any allergies for the body? For what? For the different natural dyes? No, the dyes note itself usually. Actually, they most of them have very good properties. The mordants, yes. I wouldn't. If you have allergies, I will just stick to alum and to not not to the others. And aloe is anyway, you're, uh, it's, it's one of the best ones. And it's the same type of um, alum that is used also in deodorant sticks. What was the other question? And then I will quickly move on. Yeah, I have one question. Uh, okay, are you Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I did not hear yeah, you. Can you hear me now? No? Yeah. 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 Uh, my question was about the alcohol and the, especially the concentration. Usually we use 70% uh, of alcohol concentration. Um, yeah. You can use uh, stronger or not so strong. What is the impact of altering the concentration of alcohol? And also the other solvent, like, uh, we have like oils, but we can use like something more like petroleum based um, solvents. What do you think about them? No, I would say better not. Uh, so the ethanol that I try to use mostly is 96% so that we have a better extraction, but there is also less of other substances because um, the problem is also that usually when they uh, move down the percentage of the ethanol, they start adding not only water, but many other things and also uh, some oils that actually affect uh, the way the uh, the dye is extracted. Uh, but 70% is fine. I mean, you will just basically need a little bit more um, more ethanol to extract because it will, you can then um, let it evaporate a bit and that will help intensify the color again. But so the only difference is the intensity of the of the color and how fast it will dry. So depending on what you want to make, it will change a little bit. And uh, for making, we if you were asking about oils and you were actually thinking about making, uh, so printing or painting uh, materials or screen printing, there is plenty of um, natural. Uh, all and thickening agents to actually uh, achieve like a nice viscosity for that. Are there any other questions? Otherwise, I will move yeah, to I have one question. question. Yeah? yeah, go ahead. Um, last year, hold on, there's like a relay. So last year we did um, 
dyeing with the beans and we end up having mold on our dyed fabric. Mm. Is that normal? And is there a way to prevent maybe no, natural not- dyeing from molding mm. over time? So h- how did you get molding? I mean, molding, that means that you, you have, how long did you leave it there for? Because that means it went into fermentation and then into molding. Well, it, we left it in the dyed water um, yeah. for like a day or so. Yeah. But it, yeah, it, should, it definitely should not happen. So you probably had something else that was um, moldy around it and that actually contaminated the dye bath because beans within 24 hours will not get moldy. Or at least they shouldn't. <laughs> Oh, it wasn't the beans. It was the fabric. So after we we put the beans in the water for 24 you, hours, we took out the did beans you rinse? and we put the fabric. But did you rinse the fabrics? Because then if you didn't rinse the fabric, you basically have all of the enzyme of beans actually and all of the organic parts of beans actually sticking to the fabric. And those are what are getting moldy, not the dye itself. So you uh, should separate okay. the beans from the from its water. Okay. That usually helps. You can, every time you can basically choose it, but if you want a very smooth dye, it's good to actually re-separate the, um, the dye stuff from, um, um, from the fabrics and the water. Yeah? And what if we have, like, smells that we don't like? If you have what? If we have smells that we don't like. Like, for example, if it's turmeric, I don't like the smell of turmeric. So mm-hmm. what can we do with uh, well, maybe natural? I mean, once it's uh, dried uh, dried up the fabric, um, you will not have that smell so much anymore into the fabric. A little bit, it will stay, but you could uh, remordant it afterwards. So you could do a next bath of alum to actually fixate the dye even more in depth. That will really help also getting rid of the smell. And otherwise, a little bit of vinegar, but then you will get the vinegar smell. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, Jean-Marie, I have one question regarding the iron stuff. Uh, I yeah. had some material which are really uh, attacked. Perfect. Perfect. And so if I took this powder. Yeah. It's, well, uh, no, I would say dip the whole thing into water and vinegar if you can. Oh, okay. Because actually the water and vinegar will continue, will get rid of all that uh, rust and will turn it into an iron uh, liquid that you can use for the dyeing. And if I use directly the powder, which is made uh, like, like this one on my... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It, it should work because it produces yeah. uh, every day I had a new layer of this. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Absolutely perfect. You are... Yeah, that will work perfectly. Okay, thanks. Um, the last question here. To what extent can you wash things? You, so the question here is to what extent can you then wash things? So some of the dyes are more color fast than others. Uh, so turmeric, for example, will keep fading very slowly the more you wash it. On the other hand, that is a great opportunity, I think, because that means that every month you could have a dress dyed in a different color because mm-hmm. you say it's yellow this week and then in two weeks I re it and I can do this in my kitchen and you don't use any more than for it. Um, another one that bleeds if it's not rinsed properly is campeche. So with campeche, it's also written in the documentation, rinse it many times so that you're sure that all of this color actually gets out of your material and not into your uh, washing machine or anything. And um, for the rest, it's just very important to actually dye with, um, sorry, wash with cold uh, water. That really helps. I have a question about the soy milk. Yeah, you have the soy milk question. So, um, soy milk is another different, it's a different typology of more than thing. It's actually um, what we call enzymatic, uh, because what we do is uh, using soy powder, and uh, activate the, or soybeans itself, and activate the enzymes by um, rehydrating them. These enzymes are um, transferred to the fabric, and then uh, the fabric needs to be dyed as soon as possible after um, 
the after you've processed this. So don't let it dry in between and don't let it sit there for two months because the enzymes will not work. It does work and this is actually one of the main techniques used in earth uh, dyeing. So dyeing with metals and minerals and different types of earth and pigments. And this is very good also to have what the to use with pigments that are insoluble in uh, in water. Because they will attach themselves to the enzymes and then uh, to the fabric. Did you have another specific question Sarah, around the soy milk? And don't use soy milk, use the uh, soybean powder. Usually can find it from Asian shops. Uh, Valentina, I, will, I will continue. Uh, you can ask me a lot of questions after, okay. uh, but we only have 20 minutes left and later on I can stay a little bit longer, but maybe some of you needs to go at six o'clock and we need to go through another few things, which are natural dyes, bacterial dyes now. So why bacterial dyes? Um, there are many reasons, um, but first I actually would like to talk about this beautiful picture. This is my first bacterial dyed piece of fabric. And actually the piece of fabric is very small in it, but what it meant for me was a whole world opening up. I am not a um, chemist, I am not a microbiologist and I didn't know anything about this. Uh, but I saw an opportunity and I took it because I am very concerned about uh, synthetic dyes and the way we actually go around with them or how we think that everything else could be a solution. So bacterial dyes offers an opportunity which is similar to the one of natural dyes but then with a much more technological, biotechnological twist. And this is, I'm going to present you a few of the research that we have done in the last uh, four, four and a half years and uh, some of the research also by, <coughs> done by some uh, friends and other colleagues. Um, so what are bacteria? Bacteria are very simply single-celled organisms. They actually grow everywhere. They are all over us. We are covered in them. They are inside of us. They are in everything we do. We are constantly covered by bacteria. So when I usually say I've dyed fabric with bacteria, people go like, ew, disgusting. And it's so funny because everything around us is actually um, made by bacteria. And we will be talking, uh, what you will see in the presentation, The uh, Yantino Bacterium Lividum, because um, I always say it's my first love, <laughs> and my second love became uh, Seracia Marcensis. Um, so I will present a little bit of work on both of them, but mainly on uh, Yantino Bacterium Lividum, which is a purple bacteria, and it's a bacteria that is found in nature, um, especially on the back of frogs. When people ask me, is it safe? I'm like, well, it's actually protecting frogs different types of frogs. It has a symbiotic relation with frogs in which they exhale uh, CO2 from their skin and this specific bacteria actually very much enjoys feeding on CO2 and on uh, glycerin. So it's protecting the frog from other microorganisms because it also has um, antimicrobial properties. While Seracia marcensis uh, is found in many showers, I have to say. When you see some orange uh, mold growing, it's actually this specific bacteria. It comes out uh, in different families and in different biosafety levels, which is something that we will talk about more, especially for the ones of you that are going to work with these bacteria. Um, so the one we have is biosafety level one, uh, but in the past, uh, we've also worked with um, biosafety level two. Which, for which you really need a different type of permits. So if you don't, if you have like a sort of half-crafted biolab, do not go that way, please, because it is bacteria that actually can infect you if you have a very low immune system. Doesn't happen often, but it's still it's a risk none of us wants to take, and there is no reason to. And uh, it's in your showers, but it's also very much on rotting coconuts. So if you see some red, orange, pinkish. Uh, spores on uh, rotten coconut, that is Seracia. It's one of its favorite foods. So what we have been doing is actually researching which bacteria produce um, which pigments and how these pigments are also reflected in exactly the same compounds that we find in plants. So some of these are producing indigo kind of compounds, very similar to indigo plants. 
like um, indigo, Vogesella indigofera is exactly doing this. This is another bacteria. Uh, the purple one that we will be extensively talking about actually produces diolacine. And what I would like to show you is also a little bit of the fascination on these bacteria, because these are incredible patterns that the ones that they are creating. But it's it's also having a look at something that is so microscopic uh, to study it, to understand it, and analyze how we can collaborate with it. Because what we do is actually collaboration, I hope. Um, and I will explain more about that uh, later on. But also understand the incredible kind of patterns that these bacteria produce. And these are all pictures taken under the microscope uh, here in the lab. And there's some videos, yes. So here you also see how actually the cells are created and divided, and the kind of um, uh, reaction diffusion patterns that all of these uh, create under the microscope. I had to select like three pictures out of like 20 millions, because I think <laughs> we have uh, an entire hard disk on uh, these kind of images. So if you want to see more of them, uh, you can do so also on bioshades.bio. There is a lot more of our research there. But then I also want to, many of you will tell me that you do not have the correct equipment. So I want to show you an image in twofold. This one is taken under the microscope with a camera connected to the microscope. But this one is the exact same bacteria, but then it's taken with a phone. This is a composition of probably like 30, 40 pictures uh, by using the phone on top of a very simple old school microscope um, with the light Full open, fully open, and by actually taking different pictures, a little bit like we did with 3D scanning, we are able to create this composite image and to see the full shape of the bacteria. So don't tell me that you don't have a camera or a microscope. We can find you one. We'll help you out with that. But have a look at also really whatever you're going to be working with. If you're going to do the bacteria part, what would this beautiful organism look like? So this is some of the work that we have been doing. So the previous pictures and really analysis of the different types of bacteria, but also these are some of the results. So this is an overdyed scarf in two steps. Uh, first with the purple in the Yantinobacterium lividum, and then in the pinks with the Serratia marcensis. Another very important thing to say about Serratia is that it's also pH sensitive. That means that it ranges from yellow to orange to pink and reds. Mm -hmm. So with one specific bacteria, we're actually able to create at least four to five shades of color. Um, bacteria, though, tend to like a very acidic environment, so they will turn their own food acidic if you don't do so for them. And uh, that will bring out much more the pinks rather than the oranges. But you can um, modify this afterwards by extracting the color in, uh, in ethanol. Description of that is also on the BioShades website. Um, but what we wanted to, we started this research to understand if actually bacteria dyes could really be an alternative to uh, synthetic dyes. But another side effect and another side of the coin of all of this research, and very important in the last two years for us, is actually what we call mutual literacy. So trying to create a common language between uh, scientists and creative to be able to collaborate on these kind of uh, topics. Because if we look at the research done by everybody else worldwide on bacterial dyes and bacterial pigments, we find the first research papers online very easily on the in the 1980s. The problem is that there is no communication in this case, apparently, between the fashion industry and scientists. So they had an answer to a question that we had, but we have never voiced. We haven't voiced the fact that we had a problem with dyes, and therefore nobody could actually say, hey, we have an answer. By creating a shared language, we're trying to really close this gap and actually bring this uh, multidisciplinarity much closer together so that scientists, chemists, biotechnologists can actually have a conversation and much more understand um, from protocols and the chemical structure of these compounds. and we can actually experiment in a much more visual way of documentation of the exact same protocol. And these are three of, the, uh, of my favorite uh, bacteria and also the, the compounds they create. 
So you see the violacein, the indigodine, and prodigiosein. And these are very close to the compounds created by actually plants. And they're all biochromes. These are some of the exhibitions. So another thing that we do is actually travel worldwide with these, both in workshops, but also really trying to have them as conversation pieces and have the discussion about natural dyes, synthetic dyes, and alternative ways of dyeing uh, garments, because it is a topic that has not been addressed enough. Oh, this one exploded. OK, OK. Well, actually, if you go to bioshades.bio, you will see a lot more of this documentation. And this is a web page that we created to actually collect all of this knowledge that we have researched while uh, leading the pilot uh, on um, the TCBL project, which was one of our European projects for the last four years, where together with industry, we're also in uh, testing labs, analyzing the effects of these dyes. And we did that also um, by really opening up and creating a campaign uh, for bacterial dyes. Because the biggest problem is that these have been patented and not used at all. So we sort of hijacked this by um, teaching and giving workshops worldwide, where we were conducting the workshop here in Amsterdam, and actually worldwide another 14, 15 labs uh, were executing the workshops and really having conversations between the different communities, and these were range, ranging from industry to chemists to designers, everybody experimented differently with uh, these bacteria. And this is really for us to push this research a step further, because if we don't keep researching and questioning it and trying to understand if this is really a solution or not, we're not moving forward, and we're not moving away from dyes that are actually very polluting. Um, and BioShades that by you also able to actually download full instructions. We have two booklets. One is the one for participants, and the other one is actually for leader uh, of a workshop. So you can also this is good also for all the mentors. Uh, and this is a short video that illustrates the process. Oh, sorry. Start. Yeah. This is something that you will find also online and also on uh, Vimeo if you go for BioShades. And uh, this process with the dyeing of textiles with bacteria can be done in many different ways. What we're doing here is actually preparing the fabric beforehand. And this is what I call because what we're doing is we're influencing the parts where the fabric will be dyed by folding the fabric. So that's sort of 50% of the work. And the other 50 is actually the design that the bacteria itself will create on top of this fabric. And that's something that we can absolutely not control. Um, so in this case, we're really dyeing the fabrics with the living bacteria on top of growing them on top of them. While if we use uh, the extracts, we can create plain dyes. And to extract the pigments from the bacteria, it's very simple. We do a very similar job of what we do with inks. We actually mix uh, with ethanol, and then we absorb this dye and use that as a plain dye for textiles, or for screen printing, or whatever else you would like to do with it. This goes quite long, but I think you can have a peek of it online. Um, these are all the various steps. And another important thing to mention is um, you will see in some of these procedures everybody's wearing gloves and uh, masks, but actually that's much more to protect the bacteria from us rather than us from the bacteria, and this is something quite important to state. We are the issue on growing, with, on growing them because we can actually pollute very easily their environment and actually contaminate them with hundreds of different other things that are on our hair, on our hands, on our clothes. So try to never ever breathe in or talk around your petri dishes. Try to work in a very clean and sterile way. And actually, uh, there is also some instruction on using simple camping gas and ethanol to create a sterile bubble to work under. Since we only have five minutes, I will continue. Here you have a vague description of the process. You find more information also on BioShades.bio. And I will just close very quickly 
perfect timing, uh, with some other examples of researchers and practitioners that I very much enjoy and that have quite an interesting approach. Uh, Nat Sayodra is one of them. You will find a lot of work under Faber Futures. Victoria Genie, uh, one of my absolute favorites, she has done this beautiful collaboration with a biotech lab where she created a dress that will glow in the dark for 72 hours. So she's using a photobacterium, so it's a bacteria that absorbs the light and then is actually able to release it. Um, so you, you really have a Cinderella one-night dress, but uh, mm -hmm. on the other hand, it's an incredible experimentation. And it's what I enjoy even better is actually how she really clearly states that it's a full collaboration process and that she could not have done this without a chemist. Because very often in other projects of this nature, um, the technical person, the scientist behind all of this is kept a bit in the shade and the creative in the full spotlight. And I don't think this is the way we want this to happen. It's always in every aspect a collaboration and it is really that multidisciplinarity coming together that is fundamental in this field. Another one is Pili. They are still uh, working on extracting um, pigments in larger quantities. And somebody who is actually very good at doing this in the last two years is a very good friend of mine, Karin Fleck, who opened the Texta Lab uh, Vienna, um, where she's been researching about the bacterial dyes. So about two years ago, we have passed on a ton of information to her. And her background as a chemist like skyrocketed this into uh, trying to upscale this. So her goal is really much more figuring out uh, not how else to apply it or how else we can experiment with this, but really how can we scale this up so that we can create a real viable and industrial solution. And I will just close with this really nice uh, quote, because the class of today, everything was about biochromes and color. And uh, Itten actually, while drafting his theory of color, says that color is life and for a world without colors appear to us dead. And if you think about it, everything around us that is sort of that starts losing color. So go out there and find these primordial ideas and uh, what he called the children's of light and experiment with all of these beautiful compounds that are around you. And don't worry if you think you don't have any natural dyes around you, just pick up a lot of something, go out in a forest, at a market, whatever, pick up a lot of the same material and actually try to figure out if you can extract any color. Because many, many, many colors, we have completely forgotten how to gather them, how to use these. And this is something that I think we could learn so much uh, more about. Okay, I will stop Woo! sharing. <laughs> This is just a very happy class with a s s slightly sad tone on the synthetic dyes, but uh, for the rest, I hope it's uh, you will really enjoy um, exploring this uh, the world around you with a little bit different eyes than just walking or driving or cycling through the cities, but really stop and look at what's around you because there is so much and so much color to be used. Are there yes. The assignment is um, it's also on the web page. So it is to create at least one ink and one natural dye. And the natural dye to experiment with it on both animal and uh, vegetable fibers. And uh, to color modify um, either one or the other. So use something that is pH sensitive or use a couple of different ones. Somebody wanted to ask a question. I hear some pings. Yes, uh, sorry, that was me. <laughs> um, I wanted to go back on the question about the uh, rinsing, um, yeah. because um, somebody just gave me a tip, and I just saw as well when you were doing the bacteria, the, uh, prepping the fabric, he used the iron. So I wanted to ask if you can ind indeed like use like uh, the microwave or like some heating instead of rinsing to kill the bacteria. No, absolutely not. You really, okay. for killing the bacteria, it is a fundamental step to actually putting them in an autoclave or into a pressure cooker, whatever you like to use, or find some other ways. 
um, because that is both fixating the color and killing the bacteria. And a microwave just doesn't cut it yet. Okay. Yes. So Thank really, you. yeah. This is like quite uh, quite important safety rules also in the bio lab. Wh whoever of you will be working in a bio lab should really also uh, go through all of those steps. Okay, because now that you just mentioned that it's more like a um, like a final step, not a pre-step. Because at first I under I thought it was more like a step before, not a step after. No. So okay. When we do bacterial dyes, what we do is actually we sterilize everything that we use, except for the bacteria, otherwise we will kill them. <laughs> so we're sterilizing all the environment, all of the tools, and also all of the materials that we're going to dye, because otherwise we're creating a perfect environment for everything to grow, and we really do not want that. So what we do is we sterilize the fabrics in a pressure cooker okay. beforehand, and again, after after three or four days when the bacteria are fully grown. Don't worry, I'll walk you through all of that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what are the other, are there any other questions? Yes, Valentin. Um, I read about uh, ashes for the mordants. Uh, did you already try? Like, what did you uh, have? Ashes. Uh, wood fire hashes. Yeah, so to make ink, they're brilliant. Okay. Uh, I can send you two different recipes. I have this somewhere. I will send you. Uh, there okay, is um, there is one what you um, so you can to get really blacks blacks actually with inks. The most common thing to do is use soot. So mm -hmm. with the candle on a on a, on a plate or a fire on a plate. You know what happens on the ceramic? You have this black mm -hmm. layer and actually collecting that is one of the darkest uh, blacks for, for ink. Um, but you can also work with uh, ashes as long as there is, uh, they're not too carbonized. They're not completely falling apart and white. If they're still a little bit uh, mixed between the black and the white, then it's, it's good. I'll send you some stuff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, what I what I want to add uh, is that for the ones that in their fab lab they do not have any um, big uh, like enough kitchen equipment, this assignment doesn't you actually don't... require any machine. So it's something that you can also do at home. Um, because some you labs, they, they don't have uh, so... No, yeah. But let me go in depth in this. So um, this is definitely something that you can do at home, in a pot, in a pan, in anything. It doesn't matter. But keep it a separate pot for only this and don't mix this then for food afterwards. Also, the tools that you're using, don't afterwards use them for eating. If you're using... Um, if you're just chopping up something, sure, but if you're mixing with more dense and everything, it is not a good idea to re-eat from those pots. And also, if you're planning to do bacterial dyes, don't use the same pressure cooker that you're eating and making rice from like a week later. Please don't do this. Keep those two worlds separate. One are your working tools and the other one is your private life and eating and everything else. But um, you don't, the bacterial dyes uh, assignment is definitely not uh, obligatory. This is why this is a two-fold uh, class and you can just make an inks and uh, experiment with ink making and with uh, the dyes. And for the ones of you that do have a bio lab access, then they can also add the bacteria. But this is like, a, it's an extra. It's a fun extra to experiment with, but it's, uh, it's not mandatory for the research and of the assignment. Also, like uh, time affects a lot the dyeing saturation, no? It depends by the dye. Some dyes will not and sometimes will. So some of them you will find in the notes that actually it is much better to leave them also cooling down with the dye stuff in the water. And some others actually want to remove them straight away. Other types of dyes, the, f the first uh, color that we extract, we don't want to use. Um, when you soak matter in cold water first, 
uh, you will have this yellowish water. You don't want to use that because it's going to turn everything brown. So you can take this out and then actually with fresh water, uh, get out all those reds. Uh, in the recipes that are in the presentation, there is a lot of these kind of tips. But uh, if you have a specific uh, dye matter, dye stuff that you want to use and you don't have a recipe, uh, drop me a mail and I'll um, send you back some info on how to do that. Because there is plenty more of different typologies of dyeing that are also super sustainable. There is um, also a lot of work on um, recycled dyes, actually from recycled garments. There is uh, research on algae dyes that I can send you on, uh, especially for screen printing. There's some beautiful ones from algae, um, but also earth pigments and soy mordants. The problem is that the, it's such a vast topic that actually one week doesn't cut it. Yeah. <laughs> we could have uh, six months on all different types of techniques. <laughs> But this is really a little bit for you to start experimenting and then in the next three months uh, for your project development. If this is something that you want to deep dive into, please do. And uh, then you can experiment with many more techniques. I just wanted uh, to add as a last thing irrelevant from the class is that uh, <laughs> we made uh, a Telegram uh, group for everybody globally to join. I will add it now in the chat. You don't have, no. It's okay. <laughs> like uh, extra, multiple communication levels. I think anyway we can stop recording. I actually can't. I, I, I'm unable. It's uh, not letting me do anything. <laughs>